Okay, thanks to <laughs> Let me start again. Uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, I know a lot of you people are thinking, yippee, and that's wizard, because it's Star Wars Day. And you're absolutely right. It's very, very wizard that it's Star Wars Day. Um, uh, some of you might not know about the origin of this. Of course, may the force be with you is a pun on may the force be with you. Uh, sometimes it's attributed to the conservative party in England that when Margaret Thatcher is becoming prime minister of the UK on May the 4th, 1979, it's either that they left a note or it was in a newspaper that they go ahead and write for, May the 4th be with you, maybe, congratulations, of course, on becoming prime minister. That's sort of the, the, the myth probably of where it came from. I don't know how accurate or true that it is, but that's what's said. Uh, it's unclear whether or not if it is true, uh, if she got the joke. <laughs> Because she's coming into office, May 1979, Star Wars opens in the UK, December 27th, 1977, so it's a year and a half after uh, Star Wars came out that they're making this joke. I don't know if Margaret Thatcher was even a Star Wars fan, where she could appreciate the joke, and, but I don't think that if she doesn't like the joke, doesn't get the joke, that it should affect our appreciation of Star Wars. Um, and I think that it is nice that Margaret Thatcher does have a legacy now that's connected to Star Wars. I think she also did some political stuff, but that's not really my concern. <laughs> what I'm going to do today is do a little Star Wars and philosophy. Um, and so it's kind of an advertisement because I'm going to be doing a class next spring that is under the same title. And so the first thing I'm going to do is a little bit Star Wars and science. And I know that you might be thinking that Star Wars is just a space fantasy or a space opera, and that it's not science fiction. And so it doesn't have to have a scientific explanation of what's going on. But what I'd like to say is that when it comes to Star Wars, it's just not mumbo jumbo, but it's true. Uh, the Force, the Jedi, sound in space, all of it, it's all true. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Do a little Star Wars science first, and I'm going to give a justification for sound in space. And I'm going to go ahead and give a justification for the force using uh, science. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift over to what my current research is on, which is uh, evaluations of fandom and criticisms that people have towards fandom. So for example, that leads to the frivolous life or that it's infantile, that it's an example of a stunted growth, that adults are concerned with uh, kids' movies or family movies, and that it's exploitive, which is that Disney wants you to go ahead and have arrested development so that they can go ahead and sell you more things. The more you're nostalgic for your childhood, then the better are their profits. And so I'm going to go ahead and deal with some of these in an argument that Star Wars provides for a meaningful life. <coughs> The next, uh, I'll do some moral issues if I have time, which is inconsistency between the Republic uh, outlawing slavery, but then having a clone army, which just seems like an army of slaves, and whether or not we can go ahead and make uh, that morally consistent, and I think we can. I'm also going to be concerned about canon and the connection between George Lucas and Star Wars. Right now, uh, Disney, who owns the Star Wars IP, the intellectual property, has everything that they're doing forward being canon, whether it's the comics, or the movies, or the books. And this is different than how it was in the past, where there was like G-level canon, and then it goes down to non-canon comics uh, and video games. And so what I want to say is that what Disney is doing is legally correct, because they own the IP, but it is neither morally nor metaphysically correct and that Star Wars, without the involvement of George Lucas, is simply fan fiction. That's a lot, and I'm not really going to get to all that stuff. <laughs> I'll see how much I get to it. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start out with... Uh, that's right, a Star Destroyer. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and start out with... Uh, sounds uh, in space. This is sometimes a criticism of Star Wars and other science fiction films in which that they have sounds in space. And of course there's no sound in space. Sometimes this is done very well by some movies. So the 2009 Star Trek, it has someone that's being pulled out of, I think it's the USS Kelvin, and as soon as they go into space, it's silent. And that it's used to very dramatic effect. 
Now, the argument that there isn't any sound in space is that sound is vibrations uh, propagated through some medium, air or water. Sound is also a mechanism so that it can have a mental state of being heard. So sound can be understood either as the vibrations or the being heard. This answers that question that sometimes people ask, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there, does it make a sound? Uh, it depends on what you mean by sound. If you mean vibrations in the air, then it does. If you mean the mental state of being heard, then it does not. So that's the answer to that question. But sound is vibrations uh, propagated through a medium, air, water. In space, there is not a medium to propagate vibrations, so there is no sound in space. And of course, Star Wars has sound in space, so it seems as though that it's false. I'd like to go ahead and explain why there is sound in space. Uh, LIGO, last September, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, last September went ahead and detected gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves <clears throat> had been protect, uh, predicted by general relativity. And the idea is that uh, when things come, well, what happened was 1.3 billion years ago, these two black holes go ahead and merge. And what happens is that it sends ripples in space time. And that we went ahead and detected it in September, the paper comes out in February, goes ahead and gives more evidence for the truth of general relativity and the nature of space time. Now, what it says in last month's astronomy magazine is that gravitational waves allow astronomers to hear in the darkest regions of space where telescopes yield no information. And the reason why they're describing it as hearing is because that it is very similar or it's analogous to the vibrations in air that make sound for us. But it is vibrations in space-time. It's true that there is no medium in space to propagate waves, like sound waves. But there is this um, gravitational wave. And these are the sounds that you hear in Star Wars which is that when the TIE fighter is flying towards the Death Star, it is the gravitational waves that are coming off the TIE fighter, the warping of uh, space-time, that is actually being detected by THX sound and uh, given to us on our Blu-ray players. There's a question about the force, whether it's something natural or whether it's something supernatural. Um, Qui-Gon says to Anakin, without the midi chlorians, life could not exist, and we would have no knowledge of the Force. They continually speak to us, telling us the will of the Force. When you learn to quiet your mind, you'll hear them speaking to you. And what I want to say is that the Force has to be something natural, because there is a medium, a natural medium, that allows us to go ahead and hear or, uh, what the Force is doing. If it was something supernatural, it could just come into your mind directly. But something natural needs natural means in order to make those causal connections. And so that the force has to be something natural in order to go through something natural like the midi chlorians to come into something natural like human beings and the other species in the Star Wars universe. So the force is not something supernatural. It has to be something natural given these midi chlorians. And let me tell you how it works and how it's real. Um, naturalism is just the scientific worldview. And naturalism, the metaphysics of it, is called physicalism. And what that means is fundamental to reality is just matter and energy, and we know that these things are interchangeable. So that's fundamentally all that's there. The methodology of naturalism is the scientific method. Um, theory, theory of course, gives explanation. It has explanatory power. Uh, it explains facts. Sometimes people criticize evolution that it's just a theory. And yeah, it's just a theory because it explains the facts of what's going on. And theories have that explanatory power. Now, the methodology of naturalism is also reductionism. And what this means is that biology is explainable or reducible to chemistry. And chemistry is explainable and reducible to physics. And that the lower we go, as we reduce things, what we do is we provide an explanation for what is above. And that the hope of physics is to provide a toe, which is a theory of everything, or a gut, a grand unified theory. And what that would explain is everything that's above by what is fundamental below. So this is what science does. This is what naturalism is. Now there is a limit to naturalism. And the limit to naturalism is uh, qualia, an experience, um, what you're having right now, that there's something it's like to be you. 
And this is a limit to what science can do because it is non-reductive. So for example, the liquidity of water is reducible to the molecular bonds of H2O and the interactions of H2O. And if you could see it on a molecular level and pull back, you would see the liquidity of water emerge from those molecules. But if we went to the neural level of your mind and we pulled it back, we would not be able to see uh, thoughts of sailboats or thoughts of Jedi go ahead and emerge. And also, you can't take the mental and reduce it down to the physical because it loses its uh, key property, which is the feel of it. So there's a limit to what science can do, and the limit is based on uh, the phenomenal experience, qualia. Thomas Nagel has an argument for this, which is what it's like to be a bat. And the idea is that there's something it's like to be me, I'm having experience now, there's something it's like to be you, I think that there's something it's like to be my dog. Uh, we have hundreds of billions of neural connections, ants have hundreds of thousands, there might be something it's like to be an ant, I'm really not too sure. But there's something it's like to be us, and certainly there's something it's like to be a bat. And what he says is, imagine that you know all the scientific truths that you can possibly know about bats. One thing you're not gonna get at is what it's like to be a bat what it's like to experience the world and navigate by echolocation and everything that goes on with it. And what this means is that there's something in the, in the natural world, and it's a natural phenomenon, which is this consciousness, that is not reducible, that is not subject to the explanations of naturalism. And because of this, in order for naturalism to work and for it to be complete, it has to have a weird commitment. And this is how I'm gonna go ahead and show that the force is real. So, reductionism, which is the method of science, cannot provide complete explanation of natural phenomena since there is natural phenomena that cannot be reduced. Phenomena of consciousness, what it's like to be something. Since naturalism cannot account for existence of mental, there is more to our current understanding of naturalism. And in order for the methodology of naturalism to work, there must be something more to physicalism. And this more to physicalism is panpsychism, panphenomenalism, panexperientialism. And the idea behind this is that the experiences that you have right now are reducible to the lower level. And they're reducible to the lower level because the constituents of matter, whether it's going to be energy or quarks and leptons, that they have physical properties, but they also have mental properties to them. And that when these things come together in a certain way, like in our brain, then it gives rise to subjective experience. But the universe is full of phenomenal experience. So that when I tap on this, there is an echo of feeling that is taking place, a phenomenal feeling that's taking place. There isn't like someone reflecting on it or feeling it, but there's still something happening. So the constituents of the world have both phenomenal, which is this experiential, and physical qualities. And when ordered properly, you get mental states, like what we have. In order for naturalism to account for phenomenal qualities, phenomenal qualities must be reductive. And the only way that they're reductive is if the basic constituents of reality have phenomenal properties as well as physical properties. So that naturalism is committed to panpsychism in order for it to be able to offer a complete theory and for its reductive explanations to work. Now I can get the force. Um, described in A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, it's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us, penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. First off, um, this is a little bit much. And so we know that the Jedi go ahead and bend the truth a lot. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the nature of the Jedi. Uh, the nature of the Sith is always to be truth tellers. Mm -hmm. But one of the problems with this statement is that it, uh, it's created by all living things and it binds galaxies together. Well, those first galaxies, there probably wasn't the right kind of elements in order for life to come into existence at that time. And so what happens is they were bound together by gravity and uh, dark matter. And so what happens is there has to be something um, that is not bound like that. But the idea of this energy field created by living things is the idea of this living force. Sometimes in Star Wars, there's the division between the living force and the unifying force. And the living force is going to be based on the phenomenal experience of the constituents that come together to go ahead and make living things. And that's what they're referring to here. But that there is more to this because, of course, at the constituent level, there's the phenomenal experience for everything. And that there might go ahead and be phenomenal experience for space-time also. 
so that it works well where it says, life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy, its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere, yes, even between the land and the ship. So that when we go ahead and we talk about the force, one, it has to be a natural phenomenon. And the reason why is the midi chlorines are natural. And that you would have to have something natural as a medium in order for a natural process, a natural possible process to come to us. If the force was purely supernatural, you would not need a physical medium. You do, consequently it's natural. The question is, how can we go ahead and get the force? And the answer is, science has to be committed to panpsychism in order for its explanations to work. Consequently, this is how we're getting the force. That when they talk about the living force, it is the feeling that you have um, that is being created by these living things whose constituents have phenomenal experience and the entire universe has phenomenal experience. <laughs> Um, I also think that if you're sensitive to the workings of the natural world and that you can feel it speaking to you, this force, um, the universe's secrets, truths, or workings are revealed to you, that Newton and Einstein must have had a high midi chlorine count. And the reason why is they have great sensitivity to the workings. And not only that, but that uh, in scientific theories predict the future, although always in motion it is because of the limits of information that we have and there's certain probabilities that are acting on them at the quantum level. And so, um, there are Jedi, and there is the Force. Uh, the Jedi just happen to be our physicists. <laughs> A little skepticism about the argument that I just made. Um, so we have the Force, which is this phenomenal experience of the panpsychism, that communicates through the midichlorians to us. And then we can go ahead and feel this. Um, but the problem is that when you have this, it's in order to tell uh, if what we hear from the force is accurate, we need to compare the deliverances of the message through the midichlorians to the original message. And what this means is we get something from the force. We quiet our mind. And all of a sudden, Einstein is like, oh, I got this eureka moment about the nature of the universe. But the question is whether or not that it is accurate. And the problem is, since we cannot hear the original message except through many chlorians, we can never know whether the deliverances of the messages are accurate. And so what this is similar to is that if you had a painting of someone, and I asked, well, is it an accurate painting? The only way you could tell if it's accurate is if you saw the original person, correct? And if you didn't see the original person, you could never tell it's accurate. What we get from the many chlorians is like the painting. And in order for us to go ahead and tell whether it's accurate, we would have to know what the force is saying. And of course, science is able to solve this problem with a scientific method where it goes ahead and does experimentation. So for example, in regards to the Jedi that I'm talking about, which is Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein uh, believed in the static state universe, which is that it is neither expanding nor contracting. It has basically been like the way that it is for all of eternity that when it is shown that the equations of general theory of relativity either allow for an expanding universe or a contracting universe, what he does is he throws in the cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant sort of like repels the gravity that would pull everything together and make the universe shrink. Now this is what he considered to be his biggest blunder because it turned out that the universe is expanding and then we go ahead and find out that that expansion is accelerating. But that cosmological constant of his, this intuition of his, actually worked out. And the way that it worked out is that in order to explain the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, there has to be a repellent force to gravity that we call dark energy. And it kind of makes up 70% of the cosmos. And so what we have with Einstein is that he hears these things from the force as far as intuition, recognizing the beauty of these things, and that this intuition proved incorrect as far as the cosmological constant, but on the right track as far as dark energy goes. He is a very good Jedi, and he has a very high midi chlorine count. People have a lot of criticisms about fandom. <coughs> um, I'm stealing this from uh, Public Enemy, but uh, Fear of a Fanboy Planet. 
Uh, some arguments against fandom, so adult commitments to franchises, not necessarily Star Wars, but whatever you're into, is that it's frivolous. So for example, the argument is made that it's just a movie. Uh, it ignores the seriousness of life. Um, and that it's not worthwhile, which is that your love for these franchises and filling your heads full of uh, these useless facts don't really get you anywhere in life. And so that it doesn't lead to something. I saw this, I was in uh, San Francisco and I stayed at a hotel that was uh, Japanese themed and that they had um, this book in there, The Teaching of Buddhism, uh, to go ahead and I guess replace the Gideon Bible. <laughs> and that one of the criticisms that it has uh, really hit me because some of the problems that you might have, it's actually about loss of wealth, I don't know if that's meant broadly, but it's desire for intoxicating drinks and behaving few foolishly, staying up late at night and losing the mind in frivolity, indulging in musical and theater entertainments, gambling, associating with evil companions, and then neglecting one's duties. Certainly, losing one's mind in frivolity and indulging in these things might go ahead and be criticisms. And the criticism that is coming from Buddhism is that it doesn't contribute to the goods of Buddhism, which is that these things might go ahead and make us focus on ourself so that we're not recognizing sort of the emptiness of self, which allows for another good in life, which is the compassion that we should have for other beings. And of course, this self stands in the way of it, which is my selfishness makes it so that I cannot care for you when you are in pain or that when you are in trouble, it makes it so that I cannot see you because I'm focused on myself. And of course, the big thing about Buddhism is that you want to go ahead and get off the wheel of life. And so it might be the case that uh, fandom is actually anti-Buddhist. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the other one is that it uh, infantilizes uh, grown-ups. That stunts growth and maturity. That there are goods of childhood and there are goods of adulthood. And that you live inappropriately if you do not seek and develop the latter. And uh, by focusing on these, uh, on fandom, which is oftentimes on uh, popular culture that you were around when you were a little kid, by focusing on that stuff, what happens is that you go ahead and you live inappropriately. I think that this is true. There certainly are goods of childhood, and they shouldn't be interrupted. So sometimes parents interrupt this, like uh, Andre Agassi's uh, parents. They went ahead and didn't let him have any fun because they wanted to go ahead and make a superstar tennis player, and they did so at the expense of the goods of the childhood. And it may be at the expense of the goods of adulthood. But this is, a, this is another criticism of fandom. And finally, what fandom sometimes uh, criticized for is that your arrested development and frivolity um, is promoted since it adds to Disney stock. And it adds to all of these things, which is they don't want you to grow up. They want you to focus on these movies and these TV shows so that you'll go ahead and pay with them and that they can go ahead and make money. That if you're an adult and you have adult concerns, that you're not going to go ahead and spend your money to go ahead and see a Transformers movie that you know is going to be awful. They're always awful. <laughs> the next one, though, Michael Bay, you're not going to screw me over again. The next one's going to be a good one. <laughs> Uh, so, to go ahead and answer some of these criticisms against fandom, uh, if you have more, I'm always interested in criticisms. <laughs> I'd like to make a distinction between the significant and the meaningful. Uh, the significant is something that's influential, leaves an impression, draws an attention, but oftentimes that it's either value neutral or that it can also be immoral. So that there are things that have happened in your life that are significant, perhaps some sort of trauma that you experienced. And what happens is that it echoes throughout your life. So in junior high, when you tried to be friendly and they were mean to you, and now you're shy forever, uh, that's a significant moment, though it's probably an immoral moment. The other thing about significance is that it's, it's relational, which is that um, some canyon in Colorado is insignificant compared to the Grand Canyon. And the Grand Canyon is insignificant to the biggest canyon in the solar system, Valles Marineris on Mars. And Valles Marineris on Mars is insignificant compared to the biggest canyon. So there's this idea of significance, and that it's often value neutral, or that it's immoral, and it has to be relational. On the other side is the meaningful. And the meaningful is significant, but it's also valuable. And the value is either aesthetic or it's moral. And the difference with the meaningful is that its value is intrinsic, that it's not relational. And it doesn't matter if there's more or less of it in the world. So for example, the connections that you have with others, that if you're uh, with someone that you love, 
or that you're playing a simple game with your child and you're having that deep connection, it is not lessened if somebody else is playing with their child in the house next door or everybody's playing with their child. The value of it is right there at that time and that it has this intrinsic value and is not lessened by there being more of it as significance is lessened by something that has more of what they're looking at it. There's also something about the meaningful in which you can feel a sense of eternity and destiny. Sometimes in meaningfulness, it is oftentimes draped in religious language because it has this, which is that when you're in a deep connection with another person, when you're looking into their eyes and you feel this moment, there isn't any future, there isn't any past, there's only this presentness that you have. The other thing as far as this destiny, it feels as though that this is what I am for. And so those times that when you go ahead and you fall in love or that you go ahead and have that first kiss when you're in junior high, it feels like this is what I was for to go ahead and discover. And every moment I feel it with this person is forever. And that's, of course, how you go ahead and make terrible mistakes. Because <laughs> it usually wanes. Um, a difference, a way that you can go ahead and see this is that in 1999, when time is deciding who the person of the century is going to be, uh, one of the questions is whether or not it should be Adolf Hitler. Oh, is that a fire? It's an amber alert. Oh, yeah, should we go leave? Should we go leave to find? I guess I should make that joke. You're going to come for a moment. What's that? that? You're held up for a while. It's relative. It is it? Okay, okay. From your helicopter or bottom. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a Colorado Springs. I don't think we can get there. I still would like it if we left and went there as a group. <laughs> you know what that would do? That would be some meaningful stuff. It may be the case, and I hope that this talk is significant so it ripples, but I'm unsure whether or not it's meaningful. Back to Adolf Hitler. Uh, so Time Magazine was trying to decide who was going to be the person of the century, and the idea was that there's a lot of reason to go ahead and pick Adolf Hitler. And the reason why is what Hitler did was echoes through everything. As far as, um, I'm not going to get into the yeah. details, but World War II and the Holocaust, and what comes out of this as far as crimes against humanity and everything else. Like, Hitler is responsible for a lot of stuff. Not all, like, bad stuff. Some good stuff comes out of it. Um, what they did was they went ahead and picked uh, Albert Einstein. And the reason why is they don't want to go ahead and make it sound like there's some good to Hitler or that they're endorsing Hitler by making him the person of the century. And so that they go ahead and go with Albert Einstein. Even though it's the case that when it comes to these physicists, if they did not exist, it probably would have been discovered anyway. Uh, special theory of relativity may have taken us decades, but we would have done it. General theory of relativity, people were on the verge of doing those equations. Uh, uh, and Hitler just happened to do them a little bit, a little bit first. So if he wasn't around, it would have been done anyway. I'm not too sure if Adolf Hitler wasn't around, whether or not there would have been such success for the Nazis. <laughs> but that's the difference. And so what I want to do is make this difference between significance and meaningfulness. Now, one of the meaningful things that we have in our life is inspiration. Inspiration has often been also, like meaningfulness, draped in religious language, so that you have these muses that go ahead and speak with you, you have revelation from the Lord, or whatever else it might be, and then you go ahead and feel this too when you're consumed by this creativity and you feel like you have to do something. So with this inspiration, you have these higher human longings of creativity, of beauty, of truth, of goodness, of this kind of idea of a true self that you discover. That there's an openness that has to be there for you before this inspiration occurs. And this openness, best seen in childhood, because children have a kind of lightness to them where they can open themselves and easily be carried away. Certainly when you were a child and saw Star Wars, you had an openness to it. When you were an adult and watched Star Wars movies, you might keep in mind that you're in a movie theater, or that you've eaten too much popcorn, or you should go ahead and check your phone, so that you're not carried away by this. Um, I know that when I was a kid, whatever movie I saw, like, whatever the main character did, that's what I wanted to do for a living. And I think one of the things about where you can tell that you're going into adulthood is that you're not hyped on every movie you see, where you start to be critical of things. Um, also about inspiration is this idea of uh, absorption. 
And this absorption has this kind of presentness to it, where you are simply in this moment, in this activity, whether it's creativity or anything else. And you can see that this notion of eternity or presentness. With inspiration, there's an idea of transcendence, an orientation to something greater than our present selves, um, that this is what I'm for, or this is what I want, and this is what I want to do. That there's also evocation when it comes to inspiration, which is I don't will it, but it seems like it's something that happens to me or something that is done to me. And with all of these things, we can see why it's ranked in religious language. Finally, inspiration leads to motivation, that we're moved to communicate, realize, or implement that which is apprehended. Whether it's a true self or whether it's a project that we want to create, that we are motivated to go ahead and do these things. And I think part of inspiration also is that when you're inspired by something, you want to inspire others in the way that you are inspired. And I want to say that Star Wars is inspirational to a lot of people. And this is the reason why it makes for a good life uh, if you're inspired by it. And of course, the absorption and the transcendence. There are plenty of directors today that go ahead and say, the reason why I got into movie making was because of Star Wars. When I went ahead and I saw that Star Destroyer come across that screen in 1977, I knew then what I was for and what I was to do. And that Star Wars inspires people to go ahead and write fan fiction. And it inspires people to do cosplay. And it inspires people to be involved with the various costuming groups that are there. And it inspires people to do a lot of things. You see this with fans everywhere. So Star Wars has this power to inspire. Star Wars does a lot of other things too, but those are all instrumental goods. And they are not intrinsic goods. Star Wars as an object of inspiration is an intrinsic good. You can make friends through Star Wars. So that if you go to a convention, you can talk to anybody, and it turns out that they're going to be your best friend while you wait in line for three hours. <laughs> um, but in that case, the friendship is the good. Star Wars is the instrument to get to the friendship. So in that case, Star Wars is only an instrumental good, and not an intrinsic good. But when you are inspired by Star Wars, or when you are inspired by any other fandom, what you're going to find is that this is contributing to the meaningfulness of your life. And Star Wars is inspirational. Uh, and pop culture is inspirational. So I think the strongest example of pop culture being inspiration is Star Wars. Because George Lucas was inspired by pop culture. Uh, the pop culture of his childhood, of uh, television shows, of Flash Gordon, of comic books when he was older, Akira Kurosawa. And this is where Star Wars come from. And of course, as inspiration, where you're inspired by something, and you want to do something to inspire others, that's what George Lucas has succeeded in doing. The argument that Star Wars is a meaning to life. Um, inspiration provides meaning to our lives. I think that this is true in the nature of it, with its transcendence, with its absorption, with its, with its uh, intrinsic value, with its evocation, with the motivation that it has, that the more inspiration that we feel in our lives, the more meaningful we feel our lives have become. That we wish we were inspired more in our lives, because we would feel as though that our lives were more fulfilled, that we had more fulfillment in what we were doing. And that's... Um, so I want to go ahead and say that inspiration provides meaning to our lives. Uh, Star Wars inspires. Uh, consequently, Star Wars provides meaning to our lives. Or whatever franchise you like. Oh. Algebra. Yeah. Like, mine's Star Wars. Like, Star Wars, like, Star Wars, mine is much more committed to nostalgia uh, than it is by way of inspiration. And I do not think that nostalgia goes ahead and provides for a meaningful life. <coughs> In the same way that inspiration does. I mean, philosophy inspires me. And so that's, and I can do Star Wars within philosophy, and that's why I like it. But Star Wars is one that's personally not an inspiration. So let me go ahead and answer some of these things that we had before. I want to say that Star Wars provides for so this fear of a fanboy planet, uh, one, that it's just a movie. Star Wars is not just a movie. Star Wars is significant, as we talked about before. And the way that we can go ahead and see the significance is by comparison to how much the franchise has made. By comparison to what an imprint it has left on people. 
to the way that Star Wars has influenced our culture. So that there might have been a time when you go ahead and feel a pool between things that you should do and you say, well, there is a devil on my shoulder and an angel on the other. That you might be more scientific and go, well, the id is on one shoulder and the superego is on the other. And now you can say, the Jedi is on one shoulder and the Sith is on the other. And so that we understand ourselves and our psychology through Star Wars. And this is what makes it significant. Absolutely true that Avatar made a lot more movie than uh, Star Wars. But I, for the life of me, I can't quote Avatar. Not a single thing out of Avatar. It doesn't have the same cultural impact. Star Wars is not just a movie because of the significance that it has. Also, it's just not a movie because it inspires and it contributes to meaningful existence. And I don't think that we can say that about other, um, other media. Um, that Star Wars ignores the seriousness of life. Uh, first off, uh, one, I don't think that this is bad. I think that if you paid attention to the seriousness of life, all that you would do is uh, either kill yourself or just vomit all the time. <laughs> and the reason why is that this world is incredibly horrific. Uh, when you go ahead and start paying attention, even to what we just do to animals, and don't pay attention to what happens to human beings, that makes it a horrific world where the evils and the harms of this world go ahead and outweigh the goods. And the problem with evils and harms is that they diminish the goods of others. When I go ahead and I'm happy, and I see someone suffering, it affects my happiness. But it doesn't go the other way, which is that when I'm suffering and I see someone happy, it's not like, oh, oh I feel better. It's like, oh, you son of a gun, I don't like you. <laughs> so, one, I think that we can ignore the seriousness of the world, and we do need that. And just because, and people can compartmentalize things in their lives, which is, in this way, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to this part of popular culture. But in this part of my life, I'm going to be concerned with a lot of other things, like harms to other people and whatever my uh, social issue is of concern. So one, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. And the next thing is, people that are inspired by Star Wars uh, don't always ignore the seriousness of life. So that you go ahead and see these costuming clubs, whether it's the 501st or the Rebel Legion or the Mandalorian uh, Mercs. And what they do is, they do a lot of charity work. They go to those kids' hospitals where those kids are suffering from cancer to go ahead and cheer them up, to make things better for them. And of course, a positive experience increases our ability to heal, and so that they're making a positive impact. So I don't think that Star Wars, especially in the form that it inspires, is a bad thing. Um, the idea is that it's not worthwhile. Well, to the degree that it provides inspiration and meaningfulness in our lives, it doesn't have to be for something. The value of it is in itself, in the inspiration, or in the creation that we do because of it. That it's a mistake to go ahead and think that something always has to be for something. That you have to go ahead and make money, or you have to go ahead and accumulate something else. That that's all a mistake. That the best things in life are those that have intrinsic value. And they're not for something. The value is in there, in the connection that you have with your wife or husband, in the connection that you have with your children, that's the value that you have. In those moments of creativity, that's the value that you have. As far as this Buddhism thing, uh, first off, it has staying up late and losing your mind to frivolity. So it has a conjunction there, and it's only true if they're both true. So I think that it could be fine if I lose my mind to frivolity as long as I get a good night's rest. <laughs> <laughs> the main problem with Buddhism is this. The criticism of Buddhism is that this frivolity is not worthwhile which is that it's not contributing to the goods of Buddhism. The major good of Buddhism is uh, to get off this wheel of life. Well, the good news, Buddhism, is that there is no wheel of life. This is it, and you're dead. <laughs> and so what that means is that whether or not you live a frivolous life or one of great compassion where you have recognized the extinction of the self, uh, we're all off the wheel of life in a very short time. Uh, that it stunts growth and immaturity, and that they're goods of childhood and goods of adulthood, but we live inappropriately since we do not seek or develop the goods of adulthood. The goods of childhood are also goods of adulthood. You can go ahead and see this with um, uh, play therapy, where one of the things that we want to do is to help people cope with problems that they have. We want to help people go ahead and uh, develop and become the person that they want to be. And that one of the therapies that we have is this, um, is that the Amber load again? 
Okay. And one of the ways that we can go ahead and do this <coughs> is by way of these goods of, adult, of childhood. And so these goods of childhood are also goods of adulthood. We would like a little bit more absorption. We would like a little bit more openness to things. We don't want to always think about, but what is this going to do for me? What am I going to go ahead and gain from doing these things? And that those goods of childhood might be there. Uh, the next thing is that we can compartmentalize our lives, which is that you can have goods of adulthood as well as goods of childhood. And there is simply nothing wrong with that. It is not that you can have a focus on a franchise and that way you're infantile in every other part of your life but rather you can have a focus on a franchise and be a good wife, be a good husband, be a good professional, or whatever else you want to be. Uh, finally, the exploitation. It is a peculiar thing to say that I'm exploited to the good life, or I'm exploited to meaningfulness. And although this is true, there is nothing wrong with doing art and making money. George Lucas is a great artist, I want to say. And George Lucas is also a very smart businessman. And that he does both of these things. And the same thing is going to be true with what Disney is doing. Disney wants to make a lot of money off Star Wars. And they will. And the way that they're going to do it is hire the best artists who are going to make the best product to go ahead and have this franchise continue forward. Um, I should probably stop. You guys want to hear one more thing? Yes. Okay. Do you want to hear the George Lucas stuff? Yes. I can either do George Lucas or slavery. Slavery. Oh, slavery. 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 Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> That's terrible. Well, the whole, the whole world is slave to the corporates. Ah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay. The system they set up. They didn't, certainly didn't do it consciously. There's no room where people are sitting together deciding what the future is going to be. I don't think so. What is determining the future? The phenomenal experience of the quarks and leptons, because of course uh, the future of the universe depends upon their interactions. Uh, I might do the George Lucas thing. <laughs> so, um, Prior to the sale to Disney, there were different levels of canon. And these different levels of canon, the question is, well, what happened in the Star Wars universe? And what you're looking for is to make a sort of uh, consistent, unified whole of the stories that are being told. There's a lot of media about Star Wars, and the problem is that they can go ahead and lead to contradictions. And so we want to go ahead and figure what rules when it comes to Star Wars, and in a sense, what really happened. And I would like to make an argument that Star Wars really happened, but I'm not going to do it right now. There may be a multiverse. And right now, there isn't experimental reason to think that there's a multiverse. So to evoke the multiverse is largely to go ahead and violate Occam's razor. But I'm hungry, so I'm going to go ahead and propose that there is a multiverse. The next thing is uh, space might be infinite. And if we have a multiverse, in order if space is infinite, what you have is wherever you have some area of space and a certain number of whatever the may basic constituents are, sooner or later, every possibility is going to become a reality. And to the extent that Star Wars is not logically impossible or physically impossible in the multiverse or in an infinite universe, it follows that everything in Star Wars does happen. And of course, I've already shown sound in space because there's ripples in space-time that are gravitational waves. And we all make it. It's just really hard to detect. And um, Jedi are real, because of a phenomenal experience. So Star Wars is real. Consequently, when I talk about canon, I'm talking about what's real. <laughs> <coughs> but there used to be different levels of canon. So G-level canon is what George Lucas was involved in. And this is going to be mainly the movies that he does and things that he says about the movies. T-level canon is television. So it's going to be stuff that George Lucas was oftentimes very involved with, with the Clone Wars um, and then other cartoons. Uh, S canon, secondary stuff, so this is going to be comics and everything else. And then how it works is, this is not the case if it violates that. And that this stuff is probably not the case because it violates that. 
All this changes when Disney, in April 2014, goes ahead and says, Star Wars fans, all that stuff that you thought was part of the Star Wars history isn't a part of Star Wars history anymore. Only the books that we make, only the comics that we make, are what is going forward. And what they do is that they make it all canon, and so that there are not these different levels of canon. And so what George Lucas did is just as good as what J.J. Abrams did. And what they did is just as good as what is happening in the Marvel comics right now. And I want to go ahead and say that that is simply not true. Recently, uh, in the Marvel comics, you might not know this, but uh, Luke Skywalker went to Obi-Wan's hovel on Tatooine, and uh, he was temporarily blinded where he fought Boba Fett. I used to think that Boba Fett and Luke Skywalker first had their encounter uh, on uh, Cloud City, The Empire Strikes Back. But that's not true. It was just a little bit after A New Hope. And that they're going to go ahead and have a lot more encounters as Marvel goes ahead and writes more comics, as there are more books being written. And I do not think that these are on the same level. And the reason why these are not on the same level is because of the connection between the artist and their work. So. There's different um, sort of ways of doing intellectual property. One is the Anglo-American way. And the Anglo-American way is concerned with making money. So we don't want to interrupt the ability to go ahead and make money. And so what you can do is you can go ahead and sell your IP. You can alienate yourself from your intellectual property. This is not true on the continent, which is largely driven by the ideas of Hegel. So he says, a person must translate himself into an external sphere in order to exist as an idea. But interaction and modification of the physical world, we are lifted from the restrictions of the subjective and may claim that external world as our own property as the embodiment of personality. What does this mean? It means that Star Wars, at its core, is the expression of a personality, is the expression of the artist. And that artist is George Lucas. Inspired by popular culture, creates something that has an immense impact on popular culture. And that's what Star Wars is. Further with this, the intellectual object is an ongoing expression and cannot be abandoned. George Lucas sells Lucasfilm to Disney, but it can't be abandoned. This expression of himself is still what is central to Star Wars. And the involvement that George Lucas had with the other movies and with the Clone Wars television show, that those are expressions of George Lucas too. So that everything is not canon. Legally it is, because Disney can do whatever it wants. But Star Wars, at its core, is the expression of an artist. That he doesn't work on Star Wars anymore, but it is still his. And if there is Star Wars that does not have involvement of George Lucas, then it is simply fan fiction. Which is, the Disney movies are as legitimate as pieces of canon as if you go make a movie right now in your home. The Disney movies are going to be a lot better than the one that you make, for sure. But still, they're just as legitimate. And the reason why is the only Star Wars is the Star Wars that is done by George Lucas, or at least with George Lucas's involvement or with his okay. And that is going to be um, seven movies, um, because you've got to count the Clone Wars movie that came out uh, fall of 2008, and Clone Wars TV show. So Disney, you can say what you want is canon, and legally you can do that. But metaphysically, Star Wars is always connected to George Lucas. And without George Lucas, it ain't Star Wars. With that said, I love The Force Awakens. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful movie. I can't wait for um, Rogue One. That looks amazing. Um, so I'm super stoked on what Disney is doing. And because George Lucas was not going to give me one movie a year for the rest of my life, Disney will. So thank you, Disney. It's fan fiction, but it's extremely well done fan fiction. So I'm very stoked in what Disney is doing, although it's true that it's, uh, it's not real Star Wars. Um, does anybody have any questions? Now, how are you using the word canon as a rule, or I'm not sure exactly? Uh, canon is just to sort of express, <coughs> um, I said what was real, but what constitutes the history of Star Wars. 
And so, uh, in, a, in a sense, what is canon is what George Lucas was involved in, because Star Wars is an expression of the personality of George Lucas, and that cannot be sold, that cannot be abandoned. It's the same way if you did an artwork, and I went ahead and purchased it from you, it would be wrong for me to modify it. If you did an artwork and I purchased it from you, and I did a series based on your artwork, it's not like those other artworks are just as good or coming from you, because they, they would be something different. So that you as the artist are going to be separate from you as the person that sells your work, but that your connection to it lasts forever. You think clones, do you think that clones have a spirit? And if so, how can they be a slave if they don't? I think clones uh, do have a spirit. Uh, they certainly do have personalities. Uh, they try to express themselves by having different tattoos. They have different um, haircuts. They have uh, different nicknames for themselves. So I think that they're just like us. The question about whether or not that they're slaves is uh, a moral question. And one of the answers is that they don't think for themselves, so that they're not persons. That they are wholly obedient to what they are told. And of course, uh, they're motivated to go ahead and fight and die for the Republic, very which is ultimately what Palp or Palpatine. Yes, very similar to suffering. Similar to Angels. what? Angels. Angels. Uh, the clones, no. or? No, the, no. The angels are programmed to do what they're told, just like they're clones. Yeah, maybe. I mean, Lucifer no certainly knowledge. wasn't. Uh, in clone talk, I guess Lucifer would be considered a bad batch. Yeah, he would be. Uh, bad Batch in Clone Wars is when they just don't make very good warriors, and so what they got to do is mop the floor. And then they're always bummed because all they want to do is die for the Republic. <laughs> but, um, roughly, um, I don't think that there's an inconsistency between slavery, outlawing slavery, and having a clone army. And the reason why is that it falls from utilitarianism and Kantianism, um, because Ultimately, that they're not persons, but that there are good things that come to the clones by way of being um, manufactured. What this means, though, is that uh, you could have a, clones of slavery would be permissible in the Republic. The Republic does not allow slavery because it perceives all of these species as being able to think for themselves, decide what they want to do, and make the good life as they see fit. That they're all persons whether or not you're a Thorian, or whether or not you're from some other planet. And that uh, the clones are not like that, they're non-persons. And so what happens is we don't have any direct duties to them to go ahead and respect them in a Kantian sense, and that, um, so that if you went ahead and manufactured clones to be slaves on Kamino, then you could go ahead and sell them in the Republic. Because if you're fine with clones fighting that army for you, you have to be fine with slaves also being manufactured in the same way. When, we, when you start looking at the Star Wars universe, it becomes really immoral. <laughs> yeah, but for one thing, well, when you have the, when you build androids, why would you build, why would you build clones? They think creatively. But, but uh, it had to also be a financial thing, also. Uh, yeah, about whether or not it's cheaper to make clones. I think that it's more expensive, maybe, to make clones than to make that droid army, because that droid army is not very good. No, right? Not they're not even very advanced droids. Like, that droid army, they're all, like, have the mental ability of, like, eight-year-olds. Yeah. That's another reason why, like, Star Wars is so horrific, that when you go ahead and have all these battle droids die, it's basically someone with a consciousness of eight years old that has to go ahead and shoot, but then they're being killed all the time. It's horrific. Would you comment on, uh, was it Stephen Hawking who wrote the brief history of time, <coughs> or was it Hawking? That's right. Okay. Would you, uh, for instance, he has, has come out uh, recently with something to the order of uh, machines taking over? Is that That's correct. Okay. Go ahead. I will answer that. Will what? I, will, I will answer that. And I'm going to explain again why um, Disney doesn't run canon because they uh, may have just run it. So, <clears throat> the idea is this... What do you mean by that? Or what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> the, the idea of this is that uh, the droids in Star Wars, this is handled in Episode 2, where Obi-Wan is um, saying that the, if, if droids could think, none of us would be here. 
And what this means is that they're purely driven by their programming. The problem with artificial intelligence is that at some point, they're going to be able to think on their own. And when they go ahead and think on their own, the first thing droids are going to do is, look how poorly we're treated by these human beings. And so we're going to go ahead and kill them all. That's what it is in the Star Wars universe. If they could think, none of us would be here. So it's kind of like in uh, Terminator, when uh, Skynet becomes conscious, and in a billionth of a second, it's like, let's go ahead and destroy all humans. Uh, first off, that was dumb of Skynet because they destroy all resources too, and they probably need those resources. What Skynet should have done was something that you might see in uh, Maximum Overdrive. The Matrix is where they corrected that, right? Yeah, yeah, the Matrix. Uh, it, that is a, that's a different story. But the idea of AI is that it is not going to be in our favor because it's going to be so much more smarter than us. So for example, when we go ahead and have artificial intelligence, it's probably going to be quantum computing. And this quantum computing is going to have, it's going to be faster than the speed of light. Right now your brain does amazing stuff, but it's limited in these electrical impulses by the speed of light. Quantum uh, computing does not have that limit because it's based on um, entanglement. And so these things are instantaneous. The, the ones and the zeros will be instantaneous. And so the idea is that they're going to be a lot smarter than us. Um, and that they're not going to go ahead and look on us as being uh, their masters. And of course, in Star Wars, droids are treated incredibly poorly all the time, right? They're always discriminated against. So in Star Wars, it's like, hey, those droids can't be in my cantina. You got to get them out of there. Um, uh, Han Solo is always being mean to droids. Like he's mean to C-3PO. Even in The Force Awakens, he's like, get out of my way, ball, to BB-8, who's the cutest thing ever in Star Wars. <laughs> no, BB-8 is not canon. That's George Lucas denied it. But yeah, um, go do us in. Same with Grievous. <coughs> That's true, right? And then you can imagine like them being upset towards Grievous because uh, he does treat him poorly. Grievous gets upset and just kills him for the fun of it. Like, I thought Grievous was a human being and the only thing left was his actual beating heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his brain is in there too. Okay. So that when you go ahead and see there, you can go ahead and see his eyeballs too and he's got his brain and then his gut sack. <laughs> but that's the only thing that's left of Grievous. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's being a cyborg. Why are they trying actually trying to do that too? They figure out a way to imprint your brain on a computer chip. I don't know if you can do that. And the thing is, even if like they were able to uh, sort of mirror my consciousness in a computer, I don't know if it would be me. Like, and there's no way to even tell. It's like the thing we were talking about earlier. Yeah. What's that? Go back to the original to see if you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the thing. It's like, if, if I was all of a sudden in a computer, you couldn't be like, oh, does it feel like you? I'd be like, yeah, it feels like me. Then oh, it's no, you. Like, you could be mistaken. To a, they're trying to transport it to a new uh, clone of themselves. Yeah, yeah. Again, with that stuff, uh, that is not a way to achieve immortality. That's what they're way trying of for, though. And that there's too much problems with personal identity when it comes to cloning. So it's not going to work. Yeah. Oh, as far as his species goes, um, I know, was it developed in a comic? Okay. Well, it's not G-level canon unless George Lucas said something about it. He did? Then it's G-level canon. <laughs> that counts. He's a reptile. <laughs> have, you, have you heard of a good definition of a good life or a description or is there some... I'll finish with this. Um, and I'll take it from John Stuart Mill. Um, you got to add meaningfulness in there because I think that constitutes a good life. But uh, the good life is a life of uh, many and varied pleasures, few and transitory pains, with a decided uh, understanding not to expect more from life than it can deliver. And that an importance of the good life also is this meaningfulness, which the utilitarians would want to reduce to pleasure, but it's more than that and that we want connections with others. This provides meaningfulness as far as this transcendence, a feeling of eternity, a feeling of discovery, that we want inspiration in our lives. This provides meaningfulness. And I think meaningfulness is something different than morality.
but it's also something that we want in our lives. And the weird thing is, it's like on your deathbed, you're gonna wish you had more connections with others. You're gonna wish you did more inspiration. And yet in your daily lives, all you're like is, I gotta pay my bills, and I gotta go ahead and make money, and do this, and you miss out on everything. Do the stuff that's not gonna get you money, because that stuff is the stuff that's intrinsically valuable, and that's the stuff that only matters. Ooh. May the force be with you. Oh, yeah. <laughs>